This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. For those actors who think a job in the arches is for life, at least until they fall off a roof or a barn catches fire, there was bad news this week. You can be substituted, as poor Tom has just found out. And some feedback listeners are not happy. In real life, people very rarely go to Canada and come back with a different voice. And I did enjoy Tom's sausages, almost as much as Cumberland ones. Now, many, many listeners are also enjoying Neil McGregor's programmes on Germany, particularly as they are not dominated by the Nazi era. But do they need to be on so often? It's not the flag of a ruler. It's not even the flag of a state. Neil McGregor's series about Germany is all over the BBC like a rash. It's good, but there's too many repeats of it. And as a series of missing Hancock's half hours hits the airwaves, we talk to the actor who is Kenneth Williams. Oh, where is my early promise? Where are the snows of yesteryear? I've got medals for acting, medals, and a certificate for tap dance. <laughs> More from Kenneth Williams, also known as Robin Sebastian, later. But first, there's no doubt which issue has been dominating the feedback inbox this week. It's not control freak Rob's ruthless but subtle manipulation of Helen or the possible move of David and Ruth to Northumbria. It's an exit for an actor. Last Sunday, Tom Graham, who plays, or should I say played Tom Archer, took to Twitter to make an announcement. My reign as Sausage King of Ambridge has come to an end and I am being deposed. It is with much sadness that I must announce that after 17 years of playing Tom Archer in The Archers, the show's editor has taken the decision to recast the part. The reaction to the news amongst feedback listeners can probably best be described as, well, apoplectic. Penny Simpson, Tom Graham did an excellent job. Uh, but quite honestly, even if he didn't, we're meant to believe in The Archers as reality. That's the whole point about it. You can't just recast an actor because you feel like it. Isabel Barrick, Saltair, West Yorkshire. Can someone tell the current editor of The Archers to calm down? The sacking of the actor who, up until recently, did a great job of playing Tom Archer is a disgrace. I'd have to stay here, in Ambridge. And I can't do that. Jeff Robbins from Cheshire. We, as listeners, invest heavily in the voices that we hear on radio. This connection is far more intimate than that with television programmes. In radio, the change is much more disruptive and irritating. So I've come back to pack a few things and to say goodbye. And at the same time, many Ambridge addicts were keen to vent their spleen about the current direction of the programme, a year into the reign of editor Sean O'Connor, though it's clear he does have some supporters. Christine Price in West Yorkshire. I'm absolutely appalled at what's happening to the Archers and feel that the producer should be challenged on what he's doing and allowing to be done. Gillian Holmes, Norfolk. Before this gets out of hand, may I say that some dedicated listeners to the Archers disagree strongly with the people who are criticising everything about the current storylines. I am enthralled by the two relationship stories, Roy and Lizzie and, most gripping of all, Rob and Helen. Mike North, Lagos, Nigeria. Please, can we have the Archers back? The storylines are just getting silly. I don't know what these storylines are going to do for the loyal listeners. But please rethink this new direction. Richard Graham, I really think it's time that the writers and the editor shared with the rest of us what they're up to. Of course, we asked Sean O'Connor to come and share, but uh, he declined. Radio 4 sent us this statement instead. Characters are frequently recast in The Archers and have been since the 1950s. We never comment on future storylines. Frequently? Normally when they die. And Tom Graham is very much alive and kicking the BBC. The statement was certainly short and to the point. We have, though, invited Mr O'Connor onto the programme later in the series. We'll let you know if he accepts. Now, if you want a surefire way of getting some listeners' goats... Look no further than on-air grammatical gaffes, clichéd language, over-reliance on the allure of alliteration. Whoops, I plead guilty there. Or good old-fashioned journalistic gobbledygook. Stuart Grist. 
The other day, it was reported that the child abuse inquiry had lost two chairs. Today, we were told that two chairs have stepped down. Whatever next? Chairs found legless? Or worse, two chairs, table motions? Armed with that example and others, I met up with... Joke. The BBC Newsroom's style editor, Ian Jolly. I asked him, when did this change in vocabulary, using chair in this way, start happening? Well, I think it's probably um, one of one of the side effects of what we like to call political correctness. Um, but I don't really see the need for it, and we, we don't advocate using it. I mean, we think if a man's a chairman, he's a chairman. A woman is a chairwoman. If you know the gender of the person, then there are, there are quite good options there. Those same victims who held the power to evict a second chair from her position. It prompts questions... Now, your style guide says, do not describe someone as being the chair of a meeting... Rewrite the sentence to say, for example, Mr Jones in the chair or the meeting chaired by Mrs Smith. Alternatively, and where appropriate, use chairman or chairwoman. So, when they don't do as you tell them, do you tell them off? Well, occasionally, but I think you have to look at really what a style guide is about. The BBC produces hundreds of hours of broadcasting every day, not every week, every single day. Much of it is live. Not every word that we utter is perfect. And a style guide, as with you know other well-known style guides, we have, say, The Economist, uh, AP in America, we have The uh, Guardian. They're aimed at print. They're aimed at writers. And the BBC's is quite unusual in that it, our staff broadcasters, they're writers. We cover a range of output. So I think you have to recognise that we would be concerned if writers and people who, who script the bulletins, who write our online material, who do text for television and other screens, if they were getting things wrong, that would be an issue. I think we have to allow staff a little bit of leeway in the live broadcasting that makes up so much of our output. Another example is the use of the word redacted. A feedback listener Martin Holland wrote to say... This politically correct weasel word, dredged up from some civil service thesaurus, tries to make censorship acceptable. Nobody uses the word redacted in common speech. Come on, BBC, use the word censored. At least we all understand that. So, Ian Jolly, is the use of redacted appropriate, and in what circumstances? Well, I I think I have to disagree with Mr Holland there. I, I think it is appropriate. Um, I mean, he says it's, uh, you know, it's what we don't use, people don't use it in common speech. Um, we don't redact things, really. It's, it's a, a, appropriate to a particular set of circumstances. So redact, as I now understand it, is where, for example, you've got a transcript, and if you want to take out certain names or pieces of information, you blank that out, and that information has been removed or redacted. It, it means to edit. It means you might obscure some information for legal or for security reasons. And it is specific. So it, is, it is quite specific. And I think if you were to use a term like edit, if you were to edit something, you would actually remove it. I think the thing about when something is redacted, you can visibly see what has been taken out. And I think the suggestion that, that censor um, is an alternative, I think that's rather a different situation. Because to censor something means rather to suppress it. Another example we've had uh, of the misuse of words is the use of historic instead of historical. Gregory Rose, Leighton Buzzard. I continue to hear historic where the meaning is clearly historical. Please stop. It sets a bad example and reduces the clarity of our language. Have you heard that? I have. I've heard it. I've seen it. And if any of our, our presenters or writers are making that mistake, then they're certainly in very good company. Because historic means something of real significance and importance. It does. And historical simply means in the past. It's just in the past. And um, it, it's interesting when you look into this, nearly every newspaper has, has got the phrase wrong. You have police forces from the Thames Valley, Manchester, Northumbria. They've all put out releases about cases and got it wrong. And even the Judiciary's own Sentencing Council talks of historic offences. So it's one of those phrases that's seeped into our consciousness. We never used to use it, and now we're not sure which it should be, and so we tend to get it wrong. Does all this matter? I mean, who pays attention to the BBC nowadays if the BBC says this is the right way to pronounce something or this word is appropriate? Does anyone listen? Well, I think they do because there are thousands of people who get in touch with us every year for our output on radio, on television and and on the internet. So they do care. And and I think the thing that people often point out is that they look to the BBC to uphold standards. So I I do think we used to be a standard bearer in these matters. Um, Whether that's the case now, I'm not so sure. 
Uh, I would love to see someone at the top of the BBC take up the challenge and try to put the emphasis back on the quality of our language so that we can once again be a leader for the people who look to us, which they don't do with other outlets. They think the BBC is the bastion, and I would like to see us back at that position. Ian Jolly, the BBC Newsroom's style editor. As ever, please let us know what you think about that or anything to do with BBC Radio, programmes and policy. This is how to tell them to stop messing about. Now you can write to feedback at P.O. Box 67234, London SE 1P 4AX, or leave a phone message on 03333444544. Standard landline charges apply, but it might cost more on some mobile networks, whatever they are. Or send an email to feedback at bbc.co.uk. Or you can tweet us at BBC R4 Feedback. Thank you so much. More from the outrageous Kenneth Williams a little later. Now for some very happy listeners, fans of Neil McGregor's 30-part series on the history of Germany. Their only regret is that it's finishing this week. I'm Giles Abbott and I'm from London. My sense of German history was, of course, weighted heavily on the two wars. It is wonderful to learn so much more about such a rich culture. In this year of all years, this is brilliant programming. Alex Shaw, and I'm from Northampton. I always felt that if only we as as British people could take a bit more trouble to to learn more about Germany, it would be so good for humanity. And wouldn't it be great if the full series of programmes could be incorporated in the school history syllabus? Hello, my name is Sonia Astley. As a German who has lived in Britain for nearly 30 years, I was very, very pleasantly surprised. And without ignoring Nazism and the Holocaust, McGregor actually manages to present in 15 minutes some of the salient historical points which define Germany as a country which has very much had to reflect on its past. But can you have too much of a good thing, even when it's called Neil McGregor? Kathy Page, I'm from Cornwall. The programme, Germany, Memories of a Nation, is excellent, but why do we have to listen to it three times a day? The commissioning editor responsible for the Germany series is Jane Ellison, and I talked to her earlier. First things first, a 30-part series on three times a day? Why? We're very proud of the, of the series and of the work that's uh, gone into the thinking, the scripts, the, the collaboration with the British Museum. And when something uh, is talked about in the way this programme uh, has been, a, a lot of people also appreciate the opportunity to, to hear it off air. Yes, uh, but yet they only talk about it after they've heard it go out, when you've already made the decision about how many times to transmit it. So you took that decision beforehand, didn't you? Yes, we, it's the same pattern as we had for History of the World and 100 Objects, uh, and the feedback from that was incredibly positive. Well, our listeners have loved it. Uh, But some of them had said it's about time too because the coverage of Germany has been almost exclusively in British media about the Second World War, the Nazis, and occasionally at the present moment with the First World War. And you yourself have commissioned a series which will last for four years about the First World War. Do you think there's a danger that we see Germany only in terms of the 20th century? I I think one of the things we set out to do here was precisely to think about Germany and the Germany that that we're dealing with today and to understand where it comes from, uh, what the traditions are that make up uh, an understanding of Germany from a German perspective. That's not to run away from or escape or not talk about the, the 20th century. Uh, and the catastrophe of the two yes, world and the wars. references to Rush Marks and but, so on. Yeah. But it, it is to say that um, there is a, a, a tradition of German-speaking peoples across Europe, which is very important to our understanding uh, of where Europe goes in the 21st century. Uh, and in a year where we are talking about the centenary of the First World War, in a year where we've had uh, World War II anniversaries, but also a year where we're marking 25 years since the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, to, to think about Germany in a different way is, is very much an ambition that this series has set itself on. Well, also with us is Paul Kobrak, the producer of Germany Memories of a Nation. When did you first hear about the series? And was it one of those commissions you said, right, yes, please, or else, mm, hey, problems? I thought, yes, please. Definitely, yes, please. I mean, it's a you done You've done the previous series with him, uh, The History of the World, The Hundred Objects. What did you learn from that? That it is... 
quite a mammoth task. It is bringing together the British Museum, bringing together the um, BBC. is like dancing with elephants, two elephants, in fact. But in immensely, um, I mean, just a wonderful experience because of what you get to see and just the the knowledge. That but one thing that occurs to me is that if I was told to produce Neil McGregor, I mean, I'd feel very nervous. How on earth could I tell him anything in terms of the subject matter or whatever? I don't want to be sycophantic, but you must, anybody standing with him and talking about things in the British Museum must feel pretty intellectually inferior. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't deny that I'm intellectually inferior, but actually that's not what he's like. He is immensely open to ideas and to thoughts. But, you know, in the nature of most producers, we rely on the expertise of our experts, and Neil is an expert. Yeah, but I mean, would you tell him, sorry, Neil, this script doesn't work? Yeah. Did you tell him that? Maybe not as bluntly as that. <laughs> but, you know, we, it's, it, is, it is a partnership. What the British Museum brings to it is the expertise, the objects, uh, a lot of the research, and what we bring to it is the radio skills. And there are times when I have to say to Neil, well, that wasn't quite right, or that script doesn't work. And we and it was. We worked together. But in a way, it shouldn't work, should it? I mean, because what you're doing is you're talking about objects that the audience can't see. I mean, you put it on the website, and of course people who live in London or nearby, they can go. But it's a formidable challenge, basing programmes on objects that the listener can't see. I'm not so sure about that, to be honest. I came to History of the World late. I wasn't the first producer on it. And I was working on bringing them through all of the production. So I would work on the actual audio. And I didn't feel I needed to look at the objects. So often I'd make the programmes and not see the objects, but I could see them in my mind. And then when I needed to know more, when I needed to go to them, I could do that online. But actually, it's the stories behind the objects. The objects don't become immaterial, but it's what they signify. But one of the things which uh, has been criticised, there hasn't been much, as I said, uh, is the use of music. It often is. It's a thing that keeps coming up uh, on feedback. And let me put this criticism uh, to you, Paul. It comes from another Paul, Paul Ryan, who says... The content of Neil McGregor's about German history is excellent, but the background music is pathetic. It's distracting. The choice of pieces is so obvious, and the way they are inserted is so intrusive as to get in the way of the spoken word. Did you think hard about using music at all and about then which music to use? Yes. It's a series about Germany and to actually look at Germans contri- Germany's contribution to the arts and, and not include music would seem strange. But also, actually, we use music very carefully. So all the music in the series is relevant. In terms of, as a producer, it's, it is a tool because it allows you to work with the pacing of a programme, to give it a bit of breadth, a bit of freshness. It also helps you with the tone of the programme. But I have to say that, obviously, I mean, it is very, you know, personal, very subjective. To be honest, I've had letters, emails, complaining about the music, but I have had more, I could even say many more, letters actually saying how well the music and how well the whole tone of the series has been. And finally, I mean, I, I, I would just add that Radio 4 is a very, very broad church and we can't please everyone. If we did, it'd be quite boring. Paul Kobrak, the producer of Germany, Memories of a Nation, and Jane Ellison, commissioning editor of General Factual Programmes for Radio 4. Now, last week's cause for concern on feedback was the BBC's treatment of Russell Brand as a serious political figure and the publicity his multiple appearances garnered for his new book, Revolution. We expected to moderate our, our expectations to such a degree that we're grateful not to have Nigel Farage or we're grateful not to have George this W. Bush. But this position. doesn't <laughs> represent ordinary people. Jane Skinner from London. Russell Brand does not seem to listen well and interrupted to the point of rudeness, seeking attention for his book. I do not hear any compassion, intelligence, or understanding in his views. I really question the judgment of the BBC in allowing this amount of self-promotion for such an individual. Well, as often happens on issues like this, the feedback inbox has conformed to its own version of Newton's third law. For every action, there is a reaction. If not equal and opposite, then certainly forthright and heartfelt. Julius Marstrand from Cheltenham. I can understand why people who profoundly disagree with Russell Brand find him so intensely irritating, 
but that isn't a reason for not including him in a programme. When people are not prepared to listen to people with opposing views, they close their minds. That leads to ignorance and prejudice. John Chappell, West Suffolk. I understand that Russell Brand is a divisive figure. However, his inclusion on the show about revolution should be welcomed, since he's undeniably one of the few people in the country invoking discussion of different political ideas outside the normal, narrow Westminster boundaries. This doesn't happen much, and so deserves to be applauded. Bob Hawkins from South London. I didn't agree with what Brand said, or to a great extent, but the show is there for all opinions. And if you, you know, I very often disagree with what's on the start of the week, but that's the nature of the show. Now for something which seems to be to almost everyone's taste. I may as well tell you straight out, you're a malingerer. Go where? <laughs> yes, Doctor. Well, what did he say, Tub? I've got malingery. <laughs> a quick snippet there from a new recording of an episode of Hancock's Half Hour. The original radio series ran for 103 episodes between 1954 and 1959, but recordings of 20 of those episodes are missing from the BBC archives. The scripts of five of them have been freshly recorded, with actor Kevin McNally playing the lad himself. Feedback listeners on the whole seem to approve of the new versions. My name is Colin Langan, and I'm from Wilford Village in Nottingham. What a wonderful idea, and how well it succeeded um, on the radio. I thought the whole cast were very fine indeed. But special mention goes to Kevin McNally, who managed to achieve the vocal nuances of vintage Hancock. Me, a malingerer. I'm glad I gave me job up. I wouldn't want the lads at work to catch it. <laughs> Hi, this is Adam. Bridge from uh, Tasmania in Australia. And I, I particularly enjoyed Kevin McNally's um, uh, version of Hancock. It was very, very close to the original. I, I, I could easily suspend this belief that it wasn't, uh, wasn't Tony himself. I also enjoyed Robin Sebastian um, as Kenneth Williams. Kenneth is one of my favourites. Don't be like that. I just popped back to see how you all are. Well, who's driving then? Oh, that's all right. Don't worry. I've tied a little bit of string round the handle. <laughs> if you're worried, I'll go back and take over. No, no, no. You stay here. I've got more confidence in the string. <laughs> and having heard most of the original scripts uh, several times uh, to... to have an opportunity to listen to a script that I've never heard before was, was truly remarkable. This has been Hancock's Half Hour. Thumbs up, then, for the cast, in particular for Robin Sebastian, who played the roles originally allocated to the late, great Kenneth Williams. I asked him how he knew which voice to use when there was no original recording to listen to. Sometimes it's actually in the script uh, that you have to use the uh, snide voice. I mean, that seems to be pretty much in nearly every single um, episode of Hancock. You know, it's the one you thought, oh, well, good evening, no hello, you know. And it's, um, I think Kenneth Williams described it as, he, you could imagine him smiling through everything he's saying. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, very well, nasally, you yeah, see. Yeah, very nasally. Um, and, uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. It is, quite, it is quite tricky because I've been used to being able to refer back to the original recordings. And so how many Kenneth Williams voices are there? There seem oh, to be an infinite loads, number. Loads, loads. I mean, they've all got, they've all got, they've all got that sort of sound to them. But of course, this, um, the, uh, the official sort of, you know, the posh voice. Um, and of course, in round, in round the Horn, there were many more characters like Grunt Fatuk. Grunt Fatuk, yes, oh, it took me ages to learn that one. There are just absolutely loads. But now, it must be great fun in one way to do. But on the other hand, such is the love and affection for Kenneth Williams out there that everybody's going to judge you, and you get it slightly wrong, and believe me, feedback will get lots of letters. Now, as it happens, we've had nothing but praise just about. Yeah. So, But did you feel it was a, was a high-wire act at all? Well, it obviously is, but I love playing it so much. I don't really think... I mean, I really have spent ages listening to the original recordings of Hancock's Half Hour and, and, and really loving it. I had something like, I don't know, 90 recordings to get through. And I got through pretty much all of them. But you've really got to study because it's so easy to imagine these. And I can't bear listening to myself do it mm. because I, I know every little tiny error I make and I can't stand that. So is it just mimicry? It's more than that, isn't it? Well, I must say, it sounds really weird, but I do feel the part, you see. Oh, my, my face 
change. I hope it changes anyway. Uh, it, it feels it's... like it changes uh, with the way I say the words. I mean, I, obviously, I know I'm Robin, but I really do feel like I'm Kenneth Williams. And so when we were doing the recordings, I was... I couldn't help but muck about and, you know, play a bit of an attitude and be a bit of a prima donna as I... I'm not sure Kenneth Williams actually would have done it in, in uh, Hancock's half hour, but they got it. Well, one of our listeners, uh, Adam Bridge, wants to, me to ask you, of all the Kenneth Williams character actor voices you've done, is there a favourite one, and if so, which? Well, it, I suppose, it, again, it depends what show I'm doing, but um, I do enjoy the um, the uh, officials, you know, the um, army, because I am quite posh anyway, so I find it easier to go into the, the, the posh ones. Of course, I mean, I obviously love uh, playing Rambling Sid, but I'm enjoying the snide as well, because... I've ne- I didn't really do it, as I say, very much in Round the Horn uh, or any of the other shows I've done. And so I really, yeah, I enjoy, I think Snide, that was the most fun I had with Hancock. What intrigues me is Round the Horn isn't outdated. Um, Hancock obviously isn't. Why is it that the Kenneth Williams, as it were, things just last? Well, it's brilliant writing, isn't it? Uh, Gorton and Simpson, uh, unbelievable. They're fantastic. And, and of course, uh, the real creme de la creme as well uh, for Round the Horn. Um, and, uh, and Hancock is all about character it's, um, and situations. It's, it's uh, as has been said quite a lot recently, it was the, the first situation comedy um, uh, and quite amazing because there was no music, uh, no musical interlude or whatever. It was a situation uh, with a bunch of people who were stuck in it and uh, the hilarious things that happened. And one of the recordings, or two of them, I think, you had the writers. Amazing, yeah. the writers there. Mm. 60 years later, mm. in their 80s, they're there. Yeah. So they're listening to their words. That they wrote 60 years ago. Incredible. But incredible. But also, what did you feel like performing in front of them? Did you think in a way they were going to mark you? Uh, well, yes. Um, well, the first show I, I said I would mucked about. <laughs> uh, then I was told, uh, now, not naming any names, said the producer, uh, but no mucking about. Um, <laughs> uh, Simon and I looking like guilty schoolboys. But for them, it must be amazing because they are brilliant writers. And to hear them, if they close their eyes hopefully sounding like the, the original performers. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, does it, really? And if Kenneth Williams was to come through the door today, now, as we're speaking, what would you do? Well, I don't know, give me a smack round the head, I think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope he'd be pleased with what I'm doing. Um, what would you do? I get down on my knees and, um, and kiss his feet, I should imagine. <laughs> Robin Sebastian on a career playing Kenneth Williams. How much happiness the late comedian gave us. Yet how consistently unhappy Kenneth Williams seems to have been in ordinary life. Both he and Tony Hancock died from overdoses, far too young. But on radio at least, they are immortal. Goodbye.